Um, I'm going to talk to you very little about coaching, and I'm going to turn the uh, microphone over to uh, uh, somebody I've been working with as an associate for uh, three months, uh, Brian Alton. Um, and uh, he's going to do most of the talking. And then we're going to actually give you a chance to kind of see uh, what the whole thing really looks like. Uh, if you uh, are here uh, and you've been through any number of experiences, uh, those of you who have raised children, you know something about coaching because you've tried to come alongside them. If you have been a child, uh, you have probably noticed that your parents have wanted to encourage you in the right direction to make right decisions. So in some ways, we, we all have uh, some sort of experience of what coaching uh, may be like. Picture is worth a thousand words. I don't know if you know uh, the concept of house church or home church or small group. Um, when I was working uh, last with the Salvation Army, uh, I had a secretary who was an absolute sweetheart. She was the, the nicest, most gracious, helpful person that you could find. And I found a wonderful manual about house church uh, online. And so I downloaded it, I printed it off, and um, I asked my secretary to put it in a binder. And so she punched all the holes, she got the sheets in order, she put it in the binder, and then she thought she would really please me by finding a lovely image to put on the front cover. Here's the image she found. <laughs> uh, it's terrible. <laughs> it's the absolute antithesis of what a house church would be. But, you know, she was sweet, and she wanted to do something very nice. And uh, to this day, if you were to come to my office and I were to find that manual for you, that picture is still on there. Uh, because uh, because it, it makes me think of Shirley, uh, but it doesn't indicate what a house church should be like. Let me show you another picture. This might be what comes to mind when some of you think about coaching. Um, the charts and the diagrams and all the expertise, uh, all the knowledge, uh, all the skills. Uh, I, I've got everything up here, and you're just an empty bucket into which I'm hoping to deposit a little bit of my wisdom. Um, I'm going to tell you how to do it right so that we do good as it. That's not the image of coaching that I want you to have. So those are what coaching isn't. Here's a quick definition. Coaching is a relationship. Oh, I have, have all this on paper to hand out to you. <laughs> uh, yeah, if you can find the sheets, that would be, that'd be, that'd be really helpful. Thanks, Brian. Uh, coaching is a relationship between a leader and a skilled resource individual in which they agree to meet together regularly to sharpen the person's effectiveness and the performance of their responsibilities. A resource person to help you sharpen what you do. Sharpen your focus, sharpen your vision, uh, sharpen your objectives, define them clearly, and, and come up with a plan, your plan, from your resources to meet your goals. Here's another definition. If you come from a, a Christian um, kind of uh, real, uh, background, you will like this definition, I hope. Coaching is a relationship with a purpose of, with, with a purpose focused on facilitating change. Coaching will help you find out what God wants you to do and then to actually do it. Uh, coaching helps people discover God's agenda for some part of their life, life and ministry and then to cooperate with the Holy Spirit to see that agenda come to a reality. What is the difference between uh, coaching and counseling or therapy? Uh, some people are a little hesitant about uh, getting into a relationship uh, with a coach uh, because they really don't want somebody to go exploring all of the dark corners of their lives and all the ugly things about their past. Well, in counseling or in, in therapy, we start from the present, we figure out what's wrong, and then we, we move into the history of the past to try to help understanding, bring some healing, bring some relief so that, that life could go on. Coaching um, is something I love to do because it doesn't involve all the messiness of going around digging through somebody's garbage. <laughs> we start with the present 
and our focus is taking us from where we are to where we would like to be. So it's future oriented rather than working from the present to the past. We work from where we are today with the resources we have at this moment, moving to a better future, encouraging change which is positive and productive. So that's a bit of a definition of what coaching is. I'm going to turn the mic over now to Brian. Thank you, Dave. Thank you very much. Um, so yeah, uh, as Dave said, I'm an associate coach with David McCann. I'm also a uh, student at Briarcrest University, uh, Briarcrest College and Seminary. I said university, silly me. <laughs> um, and I'm taking my BA in uh, Christian Studies. Hopefully one day I'll be a pastor. I also run a small uh, renovation company here in the South Shore, so I'm your local carpenter as well. Okay, I do a lot of things. Oh, and of course, I have a beautiful wife and my youngest daughter over there, and I have three other kids who are not here today. Uh, and I thank her for her support and some friends here as well today. So <clears throat> what I want to do is I want to talk to you. I don't want to stand in front of the, <laughs> the slides, but I want to talk to you about the benefits of coaching. Okay, and... Um, as Dave said, uh, we work from the present and we move towards the future. And the thing that we try to do is we try to identify as a coach um, certain, uh, certain uh, thought processes that net certain behaviors, and we help you become aware of those. Okay? So I'm going to be talking about th that process, which is called increased self-awareness. And I'm waiting. Yeah. Aha. I apologize. Increase self-awareness, okay? We identify behaviors that prevent you from moving forward. Also, uh, once you have increased self-awareness, you have renewed motivation, okay? And with that renewed motivation and a new hope, uh, a coach can encourage you and build upon that so that you can move forward. And finally, we have clarified focus and values. And basically, we get to navigate through strat strategies. We see the bigger picture, and we focus our attention on the things that help us align, uh, align most with our core values as a person. People often do the same things over and over again and expect different results. How, how many, for how many people does that resonate? Yeah? Okay. <laughs> Insanity. It's probably not, not the first time that you've heard this. All right? Isn't it the same thing, though, as banging your head against the wall? Okay? And then saying, well, why do I have a headache? <laughs> you know? Well, what's that all about? Basically, we, we learn certain behaviors, and they're a patchwork of um, <clears throat> responses to everyday situations, okay? And uh, what we're just trying to do is adapt to each situation, right? Sometimes it's healthy. Uh, what we do is we integrate some of those behaviors appropriately in, into our lives. You know, we get busy, we make a schedule, we have kids, we rearrange our lives a little bit, or a lot, depending. And, and so we do these things in a healthy way, and sometimes not. Sometimes we get busy and we don't know what to do. We panic and we, and we get stressed and we drop important things. We renege on commitments. It becomes a bit of a mess, okay? These coping mechanisms sometimes become self-imposed prisons, okay? Kind of like the movie Jodie Foster. You remember uh, the, movie, the movie that Jodie Foster was in, Panic Room, right? You remember uh, what happens? She gets into trouble, and so she runs into this room, and she closes herself hermetically inside. Well, I think we do that repetitively over and over again, and then we have this tendency to forget to leave. And what I mean by that is we keep these, these kind of habits and negative, uh, negative behaviors and, and negative self-talk in our heads, and, and it keeps us from dreaming, and it keeps us from moving forward. All we're doing is trying to cope, but what we really want is freedom. So the f the, that's the first, the benefit of coaching is this increase in self-awareness. A coach is, uh, is trained to have safe coaching conversations with you, create an environment where you feel safe, where you feel secure, that you can be, um, be that confidant, that person, and you can express, uh, express your thoughts, and you can, um, you can 
you can dream. You can dream big, right? Um, I, 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 forgive me if I'm not getting the name right. Uh, Debbie, right? Okay, my first time here. <laughs> and I'm looking at the brochures and saying, okay, what's her name? Anyway, <laughs> Debbie, we were talk- you were talking about uh, James 5.16, right? This is, a, a, you know, a, this is one of those places that you can speak to someone safely, okay? And talk about those things that trouble you. Uh, not, like I said, not as a counselor, but as someone who can at least give you permission to, say, to look at a situation and say, you know, maybe th- this isn't exactly working out the right way. Okay? So the, this, this, our, as a coach, we're recogn- we are able to recognize patterns in, in the way someone speaks. They repeat things often and say, say stuff. And we, we, we kind of look at that and say, hey, have you noticed that you maybe, maybe you're, you've been saying this a little bit? Let's talk about that a little bit, you know? And uh, allow you to rethink your, your behavioral patterns uh, in those conversations. And we can take t- steps towards freedom and in those safe coaching opportunities, uh, sorry, and, and so those safe coaching conversations can be an opportunity to take a step towards freedom, okay? A lot of us have dreams, right? Who does, is there anybody here that doesn't dream? <laughs> okay, so, but for many of us, those dreams never become a reality. Well, just to give you an example, this is an obituary of a dream. Brian's dream was a good dream. His dream was responsible, idealistic, but not too lofty. His dream spent many years residing in the comfort of his head. His dream always meant to be realized, but sadly, on a cold winter day, his dream was taken from him due to his circumstances. For a lot of us, our dreams are dead on arrival. Okay? They never, they're never realized. We never, see the, we never see them come to fruition. When somebody asks you, how are you doing today, what is your usual answer? Mine is usually, well, under the circumstances, I'm okay. The problem that a lot of us have is we end up becoming victims to our circumstances. Okay? We end up, we, we're not exactly sure who we are. We don't know uh, why we do some of the things that we do. And a, a lot of the time we end up in this kind of realm of negative thought. Okay, we end. We say things like, "I can't do this. This won't work," and that would be bad because you know. And so we kind of get, we kind of get this rumor, this mill, milling going on in our heads. I, I don't know, you know. And we just never go move forward. A coach can help you stop that negative self-talk and uh, help you look for ways to say yes to the things you said that you couldn't do. Which leads to renewed motivation, okay? Suddenly, once we understand our behaviors, once we know that we we often come to this one thing over and over again in our lives, then we are able to manage it, and we have renewed motivation, and we can have freedom from it, right? So with the help of a coach, we can have new hope. Not Luke Skywalker new hope. I don't know. Uh, I didn't really mean, I don't really mean that. What a coach can do is help uh, empower you uh, with the freedom to think differently. The freedom to make new choices and the freedom to dream bigger dreams. He can be your biggest encourager. He can celebrate your victories and cheer you on. More like Obi-Wan Kenobi, right? (laughs) So your coach can help identify ways that you can achieve your goals. Okay, so when someone asks you, oops, a little bit back. When someone asks you what you're, how you're doing, you no longer say under the circumstances. You've risen above those circumstances, right? And because you no longer allow yourself to be a victim to the to to them, and because your your thought patterns no longer let you stay under them. You following? A German war theorist named Carl von von Clausewitz said, The great uncertainty of all data in war is a peculiar difficulty, because all action must, to a certain extent, be planned in a mere twilight, which, in addition, not infrequently, like the effect of a fog or moonshine, 
this is in the 1800s, by the way, gives to things exaggerated dimensions and unnatural appearance. We often, it, when circumstances arise, we often make choices in a mere twilight, right? We think we have to make that choice right away. But when we make choices quickly and when we make choices without thinking things through, we end up falling back into our old patterns, into our old prisons, okay? We don't take time to collect the data, okay? We don't see everything that we need to see to make the right choice. So this, uh, re these choices end up being based on, on distorted view, okay? As Mr. Klausowitz said. This can result in common, uh, sorry, this commonly can result in costly compromises, okay? And we often, when we make these decisions, they may not or often do not align with our own values, okay? That's important, right? As followers of Jesus, that's really important. Which brings us now to the, another benefit uh, of having a coach, which is, clarified focus and, and the ability to line them up with our values, right? So your coach can have you have conversations with you that help you be strategic and map things out, help you get from where you are to where you want to be, as Dave said, right? And it's an opportunity to collect all the data, okay? to have clear information, to, to know and weigh all the pros and cons and the things that need to be done to, to, to make the right choice, right? It allows you to, so instead of seeing life through a fog of war, okay, where our view might be distorted, with the help of a coach, we get to see the bigger picture. And seeing the bigger picture, right, looks different. Seeing the bigger picture allows us to make decisions with pinpoint accuracy and choose the steps that best align with our values and helps us to be focused on those and then not get distracted by all the peripheral, okay? Finally, with the help of a coach, you can make smarter choices, okay? Smarter choices are choices that are specific, measurable, attainable, realistic, and trackable, meaning I can keep, keep track of time and accountability, et cetera, et cetera. So now I'm going to invite Dave back up, and uh, we're going to give you a demonstration uh, about uh, what coaching is all about. So, uh, Brian and I chatted briefly about this, and um, up until um, this morning about uh, 11.30, we hadn't really decided who was going to coach who. Uh, it could go either way, uh, but um, we tossed a coin. I won't, I won't tell you who won or who lost, but I'm going to coach Brian. We're going to try and capture what usually is a conversation, conversation would take between 30 in 45 minutes and reduce it to about 15 because your attention span and, the, and, and your time are important to us. So, um, and we're also doing this in front of you, so there's a little bit of pressure. Mm -hmm. I can handle pressure. I can relax in the middle of... All right, so I'm ready. Uh, what I want you to do um, as you're listening to the conversation is uh, you can you can either... Uh, imagine yourself in, in my skin or in Brian's skin as a participant in this conversation. What do you see happening? What does the process look like? Is there anything when you actually see this coaching demonstration that surprises you and says, that's not what I really thought the coaching would be like? Uh, and can you imagine a situation where a coaching conversation would be really helpful to you or to somebody that you know? That means Brian's presentation is up, and we're going to start the coaching thing. Uh, I need to get you a microphone. Oh, you got a microphone. Good I'm stuff. already prepared. Okay. I've been coached well. You okay with your face in the projector? 
I'm, it's uh, fine for fine with me, as long as it's I'm fine. okay. Okay. I, I'm, you know, being under the spotlight, it, you know, got to tell the truth. Um, number, first of all, I want to thank you for being willing to uh, to kind of do this publicly, Brian. I appreciate that. That's not a problem, um, Dave. Thanks. And um, I, I want to start by reminding you uh, of the values that I have as a coach and that I subscribe to. That this conversation is confidential. <laughs> Just me and you, right? <laughs> it's, it's confidential. It's just, just me and you and the people here. And apparently, I just heard this is streaming live on the Internet, That's right? Great. So uh, you're, raise your right hand. You're all sworn to secrecy. This is confidential. Um, but um, thank you for, for being willing to, to do this. Wh you. What do you think uh, would be helpful for us to talk about in a, a, a brief conversation? Somebody over here, uh, give me a signal in 10 minutes to let me know I have five minutes left. Will somebody do that? Okay, thank you. Well, Dave, uh, just to uh, just to say, you know, I, in the beginning when I introduced myself, I mentioned a list, laundry list of things that I got going on, and I feel um, in a lot of ways that uh, I don't seem to have a handle on the on the scheduling of those things, and I, you know. Being in a new business, it's sometimes there's things to do, and sometimes there's not, and so it's hard for me to manage my time. So I thought maybe we could have a quick conversation about time management. Okay, tell tell me a little bit more about what you're feeling with this kind of all this stuff happening. Well, I mean, obviously there there's some other <laughs> underlying issues where I feel like um, I feel like I get uh, a little overwhelmed by the thought of everything that I have to do, but then I end up stuck in this prison uh, where I just uh, I kind of I kind of like freeze and then just don't do anything so okay now are you talking very focusedly about the the business stuff that you're thinking about or about the the total of like business and family and children and yeah well I think if if to clarify exactly what I'm talking about is I need to kind of figure out time allotment and you know and really stick to those times because so what will happen is I, it's like tyranny of the urgent, you know. Mm -hmm. I do this now because this comes up, and I do this now because this comes up. And at the end of the day, I actually don't feel like I've done a lot. Okay. So, even though maybe I've done a thousand things. and yeah. Yeah, I, So part of it's how I feel, and part of it is just I don't feel organized enough. Okay. Now, so am I understanding correctly we're, we're going to focus particularly on uh, what's happening relative to starting the business? Uh, relative to starting the business and school. Which is something that's a, a time commitment for me. Okay. So tell me a, a little bit about your time commitment to school. Time commitment to school is up to me. I have deadlines to meet. Uh, I always meet them, but I uh, I've always find myself uh, working on a lot of stuff in the last, very last minute. Okay. So. Is that kind of a um, personal style when you think back over time? Uh, I, yeah, I, I think that's a good question uh, because... Uh, that also that gives me permission to think that maybe it can be a personal style. It's maybe it's a personal. It's it's what I've been doing, but I don't really feel comfortable in it. Okay. When was the last time when you had something you were working on that you you did feel comfortable about the way it ended? Yeah. Um, basically, I uh, when I started I, most of my courses we have eight months to complete each okay. course. But the first assignment of every course is six weeks. Uh, submittal, just to, they, that they want you to get things going, sure. you know. And I felt really good about these these two courses that I was taking. I was able to submit those assignments in less than six weeks. Okay. So I felt like I had been on top of it and moving forward. Mm -hmm. So what w would have been the steps you would have taken to, to allow that to happen? Well, I put it in the schedule. That's I know that's the biggest thing right now, is that I just don't have it in the schedule. But with this new work commitment, uh, that's the that's the big issue is how to how to rearrange everything where I, to where I'm satisfied that I'm taking care of stuff. That's okay. It. What do you think that would look like if you had the magic solution? What would it look like? Well, if I had the magic solution, I'd probably have extra days in the week. Okay. But, <laughs> but I I have magic too, and I just banish that one because you're stuck with like seven days, twenty four hours. Right. Like me. Yeah. Okay. Um, the magic solution would be partly that the business is running and keeps me occupied for a determinate amount of time yeah. uh, to where I can feel comfortably like, a, okay, I, I'm done, and I can move on to the next thing. And I'm really in that limbo right now with, with my business. And okay. So we, we have a fairly condensed 
conversation time here mm -hmm. today. What, at the end of this conversation, would help you to feel that you really came away with something? What, what do you need? Well, what I need uh, is I need to be, I need to commit for myself um, to, to a schedule commit to and commit to honoring that schedule that's been really the biggest the biggest problem for okay me. so when you hear yourself say that um, what's going on inside uh, what's going on inside is I don't know why it always comes unhinged it, the wheels fall off of that because I I told you I no, told, let me just ask the wheels fall off about committing or the wheels fall off after having committed the wheels fall off after having committed okay can you uh, can you think of a time when that wasn't the case where you you made commitment carried on? I'm sure there's got to be a number of those. Uh, sh sure, I mean, uh, you know, when I, when I it's the deadline, you know, when you're working to a deadline, when you're working uh, to a schedule. Mm -hmm. I, if I'm on that schedule, I have a clear beginning and end. I, I get I get the work done. Okay, an example of of that. Planning my wedding. <laughs> Uh, with my wife, we, you know, we, we got everything done when we yeah. had to get it done. Right? Okay. Yeah. And, and you, you felt good about that. Yeah. And, and we had a date to meet too, so. Yeah. <laughs> sure. Yeah. Okay. We, so, uh, setting deadlines is, is a part of your answer. Yeah. Uh, so thinking about the fact that there have been times when you've made a commitment and it's, it's come off the rails, what would be some steps that you could take to, to. Uh, to keep the thing going forward, to stay locked on? Hmm. That's a good question. Thank um, you. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to write that down for yeah, the next one. Because as you're asking the question, I started thinking, well, what things haven't worked? You know, and uh, you know, I, my wife is great. She keeps me accountable. She asks me, "Are you working on your school today? Are you doing this? What are you doing?" And that's great. But sometimes I think that I need some other outside. Accountability. To that. Okay, Out, outside accountability. That could be one piece yeah. that you might think about adding. Mm -hmm. uh, you talked about um, actually scheduling or locking in your your deadlines. Mm -hmm. On a, how do you do that? Is that paper? Is well, that the the I guess computer. That, yeah, on my computer, in my in my BlackBerry, in my computer. Yeah. Okay, so you, I mean, you got lots of technology helping. I do. You. I do. I have all the technology I, I need. Okay, so technology is yeah. not the issue. No. Okay, accountability. Mm-hmm. Um, setting deadlines. Yeah. What about the deadlines? Well, I think that now that you're asking the question, that kind of brings it up. But it becomes the deadlines are too too far and too broad. I I put when I get my coursework eight months in advance, I put the due date of the whole course. Okay, so that's what doesn't work. So what would work? Uh, more. I I need to set de set my own pers in Impose deadlines on those courses. And, and did I hear you say they need to be smaller and more smaller precise? Smaller and more precise. Yeah. Okay. So breaking down the big thing into smaller, more precise, timelined mm -hmm. events. Right. Outside um, accountability. Mm -hmm. um, would there be anything else you would add to, to a plan that would, would, would help you get this on track and keep going? Do you believe in your dream of starting this business? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. How much? Um, well, hang on. I believe in. I believe that this business, as I start it, can be a success. How long it goes into the future, I, I don't know. I'm not. I'm not worried so much about that because oh, no, I'm. I'm really asking, how committed yeah. are you to? Oh, your I'm dream? committed to to the success of the business. Yes. Okay. And so to get there, you've got a couple of pieces. Is there anything else you would have to add? No, I think uh, the the rest of it's kind of falling into place. Okay, so. <clears throat> Who would be the accountability um, people that you would want in there? For the business or for school? For, for keeping you on, on track with your with your timeline? Um, have you got a list? I can make one, yeah. Okay. I, I don't have a list right now. If you had to put, give me two names right, right away. Um, <clears throat> I have a friend. His name's Chris. Yeah, I can, okay. I can ask one. him. Yeah. Another one? Another one? Mm, Corinne? <laughs> Okay, so you, so you have a, at least two people. Yeah. How many, what do you think you need? No, I, well, you mean from them? No, well, how many people? Like. Oh, no, 20? I think, I really think I only need one, so. Who? Uh, Chris. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so, uh, when do you invite him to do this for you? Uh, 
if I want to be uh, realistic about my goals, I'd need to call them or email them right away. That's today? That would be today. Okay. So you've already locked something in on your calendar? Sure. Okay. Yes, I have. And, and that's going to get done? It will get okay, done. Okay, so you're going to have an accountability person by the end of today? Yes. Assu assuming he gets your email and response? Assu assuming he agrees, yeah. Yeah. Is that the best communication style for him? Email? Yes. Yes, Works we for him. communicate well that way. Okay. And, and then taking the big pieces and breaking them down to smaller, more refined pieces, how do you see yourself going about that? I have to sit down and look at, uh, look at the coursework and, uh, and make a timeline. Okay. And the business? The business is, uh, you know, I, I, I've, I've dedicated normal working hours during the day to that. And uh, so I don't, I, I can, I think that's bonus time for schoolwork while I'm not doing it. And uh, did, did I just hear a little shift? I thought we were talking about chopping your business stuff no, up. No, school. Is, we're ta okay. Yeah. That, at <laughs> least you got that. Yeah. <laughs> Anything That's else okay. uh, that that I can I can do to uh, kind of um, help you along this path? Well, certainly uh, you can pray for me. That okay, would be great. I thought you were going to ask something like less spiritual, like kicking your behind occasionally. But no, <laughs> I do that easier than I you pray. You can do that too if you want. <laughs> okay, thanks, Brian. Thank you. Okay, what did you what did you see? What what was different from what you expected? Uh, and and I'm going to ask Brian in a minute whether. He actually came out of this brief conversation with, with anything positive. So what did you see? Yeah. Yeah. And, and you know what? Way down deep inside, he was hoping I would answer some of his questions too, <laughs> but that's not the not that's not the coaching model that we work with. So uh, it's his life. There are his issues. Uh, he has the resources and he has the solutions. All the best stuff is already inside of him, and I just want to help him dig that out and realize it and feel confident that he's already got the stuff. Okay. So, uh, all, and did I give any advice? No. Zero. <laughs> Lots of questions. What, a, what other role did I, as a coach, fulfill? I, I helped him in the sorting out of his answers. Yeah, just reflecting back what I heard. I, I changed the focus from some negative-sounding stuff to looking at the positive. That's correct. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Okay. Any other observations or comments? Any questions? Yeah. Sure. Uh, patterns and preferred style. Uh, I mean, uh, I'm going to I'm going to finish my slides and this presentation uh, probably tomorrow after I think about the wonderful things I've said. So <laughs> my personal style, although it w I would I sometimes I would like to be more efficient and be prepared like two or three weeks ahead, is is I was I added slides this morning when I realized I'd forgotten my computer and ran home to get it. Uh, I added two slides, <laughs> so that's my style. And I need to find a way to be comfortable with my style. So if somebody, if, if Brian were coaching me, saying, well, you know, to get out from under that, you must always plan to have everything ready a week and a half ahead of time. And, and you've got to time out your presentation. And you got, I mean, that's wonderful advice for somebody who thinks and works that way. So I can't impose my style which is often a danger when we're working with people. Just, it works for me, it's got to work for you because we're all the same. Absolutely not. Any other comments or questions? Yeah. Time, time framed, his reality, something he's going to actually do so that he, he, at the beginning of the conversation, I heard... I'm feeling stalled. 
now he's got one tiny little action step. He's going to email Chris. But you know what? That's, that's, that's movement from stalled to going forward to a better future. And if this were a 45-minute conversation, we would have had a little more time. And the other thing about a, a, a coaching commitment or, or, or uh, engagement to a coaching process is ideally, uh, when I set contracts with, uh, with people, I try to contract for uh, three months. So that if you could imagine the, a, a, a follow-up conversation about more of these issues two weeks from now and another one two weeks from then, uh, at the end of three months, you have such a sense of movement and progress. Um, okay, uh, let me um, go to this question uh, and give you the evasive answer first. How much does it cost? Uh, well, the, 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 oh, did you want to add anything about the process? Sorry, Brian. I was just hoping you would ask. No, just kidding. Um, no, it was, a, it was a good process. Um, <clears throat> um, I thought you would just ask me a question about it, if, other than do I have anything to add. I, before we, I want for clarity and for the interest of uh, transparency, Dave didn't know really what I was going to ask him. <laughs> we, I just mentioned to him, okay, I'm going to talk to you about time management. And that's all. We didn't rehearse this. We didn't do anything. And, and so you can see how you know, the skills of a coach really work on the fly and help you move forward. Um, one thing I did tell Dave, which this is something I think we, we want, what we're trying to also communicate to you is that this is not a lifelong, necessarily a lifelong commitment to coaching. This is, we want to help you learn to coach yourself o over time. And uh, when I, what I said to Dave was I said, uh, well, uh, the hesitation in giving you a topic is that once I, could, once I tell you what I want coaching on, I got to commit to it, right? <laughs> I already knew that going in. <laughs> <laughs> there is a repeated theme here. There is, you see? So how much does it cost? Uh, here's the evasive answer. How much does it cost you if you're in business to work without a plan, without a strategy, and to work in a less than effective manner? That's, that's a pretty slimy answer, isn't it? It's, uh, I like that. It's serpentine. Um, so let me, let me give you a more precise answer. Uh, my uh, rates for coaching are anywhere between $60 to $125 an hour. Um, if I were to ever have as a client the vice president of Bell, uh, I would be uh, thinking about $250 to $400 an hour. Uh, I have a friend uh, in Vancouver who has, um, as one of his clients, the, uh, the top executive of a significant corporation, and he charges $500 an hour. Uh, so, and, and you know what? He pays it gladly because he, he gets the bang for his buck. It's also his company that's paying. All right? So uh, those are the rates. Um, I have a, um, a special rate for Destiny, uh, and that is uh, $50 an hour. Now, most conversations, as I said, will be 30 to 45 minutes. I guarantee you that if you are in a coaching conversation with me, no conversation will go longer than 45 minutes. That's a cutoff time. And always, you'll arrive with some sort of result or action plan. It's guaranteed. So um, thinking about possibly a three-month contract every two weeks, you'd be looking at uh, whatever an hour and a half at $50 an hour is. Uh, math skills are weak. I need an administrative assistant. Uh, 70, you'd be looking at $75 for a month. Um, now, the destiny price uh, is a price for anyone who is here today. Uh, if, you, uh, if you sign up bef in the next month. Uh, so that is my commitment to you. Uh, the, the pricing variation depends on your modalities of payment. If somebody prepays their contract, they get a much better price than if I have to bill them monthly. But for the people who are here, whatever your payment mode is, uh, it's at a rate of $50 an hour. So that's why also we have your names on the sign-up sheet. If you have friends who weren't here, uh, they don't get in at that rate. <laughs> okay, comments or questions?
Thank you, Brian. Oh, sorry. Yes. Yes. Yes, I know exactly what you're getting at. Uh, and before I would even think about pointing you in a direction, I think it would be important to help you understand what your style is, what your pattern is, what works for you, what doesn't work for you, and then I could suggest some reading that you might want to look at. But um, I, uh, I don't teach time management skills. Um, <laughs> partly, partly because I don't model them. But I do manage priorities. And the reality is nobody here has more time or less time than me. We all have 24-hour days. We all have seven-day weeks. And the reality is that what you fix as an absolute priority that your heart and life is committed to, you will never miss. So it's not so much a matter of prioritizing, of, of managing time, as it is to managing priorities and being sure that you commit to them. Because if it's, if it's really a priority in your heart and life, you will get it done. <laughs> they, they could have a conversation with me for free uh, over a coffee, as long as they pay for the coffee. We meet at Starbucks. Uh, and, uh, and we would decide together whether a coaching approach is helpful or whether a counseling approach is helpful. Coaching is good for somebody who's kind of got their life reasonably well going. If somebody is really bad news damaged, and we're, I mean, we're all damaged, but if somebody is, is, is really bad news damaged and needs some help getting over all their stuff. Uh, that's a counseling thing. That's not a coaching thing. Last question. It translates into the fact that um, December 1st, all five of my c people who were contracted with me finished their contracts at exactly the same time. And currently, I have one client. So, uh, yeah, uh, and, I, and I, I am unsure whether there's a way to plan around that. Uh, a part of it is more people need to understand the value of, of the service and uh, in the fact that I'm actually looking for clients, and that's a that's a part of of why uh, we're here. So yeah, but we could have a good follow up conversation. You're welcome to prod me. Yeah, when when it works when it works well, it works against me. <laughs> Is that what you're saying? Uh, I have a uh, a little um, flyer that I've created about the coaching that I do, uh, and I just want to pass it around. Now you've already had the the instructional part, so this is actually just a reminder to you. And also, if you meet somebody who could potentially benefit from coaching, uh, that you could just pass this along. Uh, so uh, you do that. Uh, also, for, for the coaching stuff, um, I have a referral fee. If you refer someone to me 
and they sign for a three-month contract, uh, I will return to you as a payment uh, one half of the amount of the first coaching session. <laughs> one, one half of the amount of the value of the very first coaching session, whatever that amounts to. So there, there is a referral fee if you, if you refer somebody to me. We good? Uh, let, me, uh, let me move on fairly quickly to the Berkman stuff. Uh, Berkman is a uh, psychological profile to, uh, to help you understand yourself better and uh, with a better self-understanding to, uh, to, to manage your life better. Everything begins with the understanding of self. Here we are, <laughs> including the fact that we, we lose things. Uh, get to know yourself better. So uh, who are you? Who are you really? What are, what are you like? What are you like at home? Uh, what do you like, like at work, uh, at school, at play? Um, for um, a number of years, I was um, a school teacher, taught school. Uh, during my uh, career with the Salvation Army, uh, was responsible for uh, our training school for training Salvation Army officers. So it's something I do. And, and one of the trademarks of my teaching was my immense patience with slow learners. Uh, I loved the slow learners. I gave them uh, everything that I had. And when I could see them progress, that was, that was my reward. So I, 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 the difficult students were the ones I loved the most. But you know, I would come home from uh, work where I had dealt with people who just were not getting it and just been patient and showing them and helping them. And, and, and one of my kids would be having trouble with homework <laughs> and I'd be about three minutes before my, my patience level was gone. Um, now, it's, it's bizarre that, you, you know, you put on your professional shirt and you act one way and you come home, you act another way. But, but uh, we, we can understand some of those uh, behaviors. Uh, why do we do the things that we do? Um, can I change the basic me? Um, or should I even try? Uh, these are some, some wonderful questions that we can move towards answers with with, uh, with a Berkman profile. Uh, Hippocrates said you can put all people in the world into one of four categories and accurately describe how they will behave. Um, if you um, have uh, had personality profiles done, you'll know the, the four classic, um, whatever they are, uh, choleric, phlegmatic, um, sanguine and the other one, melancholy. <laughs> that must be the one I am. I don't know. <laughs> um, well, it, effectively, the, his model works with poles or with opposites. And um, on one pole, then, you have at one extreme people who are very direct, um, who would tell what to do, who are commanding who are uh, very forthright, who are um, extroverted. And on the other pole, you have people whose approaches would be indirect. Um, th when they want you to get something, they're going to do it maybe through asking a question or making a subtle suggestion or um, being indirect in the way that they approach things. Uh, on the other directional pole, you have those who are objective. It's, it has to do with, with um, facts, data, and things. And those who are subjective. W what, is, what am I processing? How is it going on in the inside? And when you, you look at these four quadrants then, um, Berkman puts them in colors, uh, the, the four Berkman colors. And we're going to talk very briefly about that uh, today. Uh, red. Uh, as you can imagine, is direct and objective. These are the doers, people who are, are people of action. They have to get it done. When you're in a group or a team, really important to have at least somebody who wants to get it to where you're doing something. Um, direct and subjective, they're the communicators, the talkers, the uh, convincers, the declarers. Down in the blue corner, we have thinkers, people who, who process, who 
are slow, who take their time, who come up with plans and strategies, who, whose, whose real life all happens somewhere in this area here. And then we have the final quadrant, which is yellow. The bane of my existence. The bean counters. Those who systematize. Those who want to work with manuals and rules and procedures and, and just document everything. Forms and... Uh, so, up at the extreme quadrant, these people are oriented around things. Talkers, the green, are oriented around people. Blues are oriented around ideas, and yellows around the wonderful systems. Reds like to work with their hands. Greens like to work with relationships. Blues like to work with their mind. That has to do both with being strategic and artistic. And yellows want to work with the rules. God help us all. So, where are you on, on these quadrants? Let me, uh, let me just ask a couple of questions to see if you've got the idea. Uh, do you like to get results by making decisions quickly and forcefully? What color would that be? That's a red. You got it. Do you prefer to take time with your decisions? Blue. Now, wouldn't it be wonderful if a red and blue are working together on a project? <sighs> Do you like to talk, persuade, motivate, and counsel? If you do, you are probably green. Do you enjoy working with set procedures to reach a defined goal? There, these are the yellows. Okay, so you've got the basic idea. Do you prefer, you prefer working with others? Green, clearly green. Are there times when you think it's best not to argue when contradicted? Those are the yellows. Okay? Now, it would be a little simplistic to say that if you understand someone is blue, uh, that, that they're, they're clearly blue and only blue. When we look at the, uh, the Berkman models, uh, often there is an area of interest. So here's somebody a typical Berkman profile, where their interests are very people and communication oriented, but where their usual behavior is much more towards getting things done. And um, that their needs are actually yellow. They need a system, uh, uh, some organization, some structure. So, so we are actually a blend of colors depending on on where circumstance brings us. Um, the amazing thing about Berkman, um, there are two options in, in terms of uh, doing the questionnaire. Uh, I mean, I could give you 10 questions and you could come up with a basic color, but it, it just kind of limits you to one quadrant and that's not what any of us are. Um, you can have a full Berkman evaluation done. It's 175 questions on the internet in a 50-ish page report which requires a certified consultant to debrief you and help you understand. I'm a certified Berkman con consultant. Uh, or you can do a, what's called a Berkman on demand. It's a new format that originally I called Berkman Lite because it, it looked real easy. It's completely in lay language, so you don't need somebody to sit with you for four hours saying this word means this and this means it's just it's it's just in language everybody can understand and. Um, it's the same questionnaire, 175 questions, but the report is in a much more readable form, and uh, it's also much uh, less costly. Uh, so if you're interested in doing the questionnaire, uh, what you would do is you would let me know. Uh, I would then uh, contact Berkman International, submit an email address for you, and they would bill me on the spot uh, for what the cost is. I invoice you, I send you a link to the site, you fill in the 175 questions, the results come to me, I create a report, and I sit with you and spend some time reviewing it. So here's the big question. Answering the big question, am I normal? Let me save you some money. 
you don't need to fill in the questionnaire to get the answer to this one. I will give you the Berkman answer. No, you are not. <laughs> because no one is normal. We are as individual as snowflakes. Some of us are flakier than others. <clears throat> but we are, we are unique individuals. There are no two profiles which are identical. There are no two reactions and interreactions which are identical. And we are not constant. We're in, in flux and in flow. Uh, our behavior when we are in our best environment is one thing. Our behavior when our needs are not met when the environment is, is poisonous, is completely other. We have positive behaviors, we have negative behaviors, and we flow between them depending on whether our needs are met or not met. So what are the Berkman, uh, what will a Berkman questionnaire give you in terms of some results? It will explain to you your areas of interest. Those things that charge your batteries emotionally and spiritually, and those things that deplete your energy. Now, when I did mine, it was really interesting because numerical is down around a score, some around 25, which means when I'm doing numerical stuff, it sucks the life out of me. It's just, it's not who I am, all right? Now, an amazing thing happens every year at tax time. It has, it has for over 20 years. I do taxes for all sorts of people. Why? I hate figures, but my high score, in fact, my score is, is so high that you cannot score higher on service, social service, helping people is off scale. And so the, the, the thrill and the pleasure I get at helping someone compensates for the drain of numerical. And so and it helps me understand. So. We, would, we, we will have some help to understand our areas of interest. Berkman tells a story about um, a nurse who was amazingly effective. And in her um, performance evaluation, she was evaluated so well that the hospital administration decided to promote her to be director of nursing. And they promoted her, and in six weeks, she went back to the director of the hospital and said, I can't do this. It's, it's killing me. I'm not doing the job well, and it's just killing me. Put me back where I was. And he said, well, before we do that, um, would you um, take a test? We want to we wanna take this test and, and then talk to you about it. And she did the Berkman profile, and uh, the human resources sat with her, and they, they started to ask her a few questions. Very, very high on her areas of interest was artistic. And so um, in talking with her, they discovered that, uh, that when she was working at her nursing station, she was also spending a lot of her free time painting. She loved to paint. And so they said, during the six weeks that you've been promoted to the director of nursing, um, how much painting have you done? She said, none. Um, and, and, and so they challenged her to continue in her job for one month but to make sure that in her weekly schedule, she allowed herself two hours of time with her, with her paints. Um, she's the director of nursing today and wonderfully fulfilled because she now has this understanding of the importance of this um, artistic side of her and having an expression that keeps her batteries charge. So understanding our areas of interest, understanding our behaviors. Berkman analyzes behavior in terms of uh, 11 components, and I, I could list them for you, but it wouldn't be very helpful. And when Berkman describes these behaviors from, the, from your results, I, I got to tell you too, I had, I have two boys, um, one of whom uh, has been a huge challenge to me personally. My wife says it's because he's too much like you, but if you were asked to ask me, I would say it's because he is too much like her. <laughs> the reality is he's a little bit like both of us, but he did this profile, and uh, I, I have my profile, and we can then dovetail them. And um, two things happened. Number one, he said to me, wow how does this thing know so much about me? I said, well, because you answered all the questions. <laughs> so, 
I mean, he's impressed at the accuracy of it. And, uh, and he was having some trouble with his girlfriend not long ago. And I pulled out the sheets about relationship and I, I put them in front of him and he said, oh, I, I'm not sure I want to do those kind of things. I said, then you don't want the relationship. <clears throat> so that's in, in, in re reevaluation. So very, very accurate. Help me as well to understand how to connect with him, and we're doing much better because I've read his profile, and I know when I, I need to address him. I know whether he's in stress behavior or usual behavior, and I will, I will use an approach that works. And he has a readout as well, uh, about 12 sheets that says when you want to talk to dad, if he's in stress behavior, use this approach. If he's in usual behavior, use this approach. I haven't convinced him to read those sheets. <laughs> it would be really nice if he'd follow them. But um, Berkman presents what your usual behavior is. Usual behavior, by Berkman's definition, is that behavior which you go to naturally, which is always productive and helpful. Then there is what Berkman calls your needs. Now, your needs... In, in Berkman language, is the environment in which you live relative to this component of behavior that encourages you to express that positive usual behavior. And when your needs are not being met, when the environment in which you are working is not the environment that you need to flourish, you are going to go to what Berkman calls stress behavior. And stress behavior is always negative or counterproductive, or is productive but at, the, at too high a cost. A friend of mine was, uh, was debriefing somebody after they had done their, their Berkman profile. And uh, this person was an employer of a number of people and, and would lose employees left, right, and center. Because when he was stressed and things were not going well, his approach to dealing with employees was I'm the boss, and if you want to keep your job here, you will. And, and, and so we, he, the, the consultant tried to help him understand that there might be other approaches. And he said, but that works. Of course it works. Of course it works. But at what cost? At what cost relationally? At what cost emotionally? So, so uh, stress behavior is always behavior which either is negative uh, or, or, or counterproductive uh, in, uh, or at, at too huge a cost. Berkman will also help you um, understand your work style. Uh, that's, that's a part of the, the way the question, questioning went with Brian. Uh, I mean, what, what's your usual style? Uh, because we all have preferred styles. We have ways of processing things. Some of us are global. Some of us are concrete. Some of us function in, in, in ways that the person who is working with us might not understand. Berkman will also help you understand your organizational focus, what you would contribute you uniquely in an organizational structure. Um, and sometimes that's a bit surprising. Um, so um, let me share with you very quickly. Um, I'm, I'm really promoting today the Berkman on demand, which is, which is the easier lay term one. Um, and here's why I don't call it Berkman light anymore, because I printed um, the workbook that comes from this um, for myself, and it came out with 86 pages. Uh, and what I want to do is, is, uh, is I want to share with you uh, one of those pages that has just been added. Every month, Berkman adds another uh, piece to the profile. And I just want to uh, show you what a, what a Berkman workbook looks like if I can find the document. Uh, now, see, if I were organized ahead of time, it would already be on my screen, wouldn't it? But at least I know which directory to look in. Okay, so you have a list of all the topics there, and um, I want to go to uh, 
this one just because it was it was really hugely interesting to me to look at. Uh, and uh, I should be able to, there's a way to make it larger, isn't there? <laughs> of course there's a way to make it larger. I did it before. Uh, how did I get to? How do I back up? <laughs> it's up? Hold on. There we are. Okay, that, this will do it. Uh, this is brand new. So there are a number of statements that you would get in a workbook if you did the, the Berkman, um, um, Berkman On Demand. You, you get a workbook, and uh, you are encouraged then to work through each of the topics uh, one at a time. And to look at all the statements that are there, and, and you notice that they're, they're all, it could be, or it sort of indicates kind of statements, because only you can decide which ones you, you really identify with. So you would read down these, this list of uh, items, tick the ones that are really the best descriptive of you, and then you, you have those and you, be, you begin to manage and work with them. So here's how uh, I encourage trust in others. What, what the Berkman profile says. I prefer to use intuition and insight to determine what others, particularly key individuals, are really thinking. Does that, those of you who know me, does that surprise you? Uh, generally in attempts to develop trust relationships with key individuals first, foking, focusing afterwards on the group. So I'm more focused on individuals than I am on groups. Uh, more inclined to use his gut feeling to der determine how to best build trust relationships rather than trying to develop them by following some sort of formal plan. Formal plan. What? Uh, finds it easy to use his naturally authoritative style to encourage trust from other people. Believes in trust as an ideal, blah, blah, blah. Okay. So that's a little bit about my trust style. Here's the part that could be helpful. How do encourage trust in him. So if you were relating to me uh, and we were in that in, in some sort of connection or relationship where you wanted to encourage me to be trusting, um, you would, number one, want to be sure uh, that I understand that you respect me. Where there's a sense of no respect, no appreciation for who I really am, uh, trust is just not going to be there. Um, understand that if you overburden me with details, or procedures um, that I, I'm not going to experience a whole lot of trust. Um, I'm going to feel very insecure if I don't know who's in charge, and that's not clear. So I worked for 30 years in the Salvation Army in a very authoritative structure. In, in my days of wonderful success were there when the person immediately above me knew his authority acted with his authority, and I understood and respected it. But where there were leaders who, <laughs> oh, fix that language. What's, where did that come from? Where there were leaders, <laughs> <clears throat> there must be a nicer way to say it. Yes, where there were leaders who, <laughs> there's not a nicer way to say it, right? <laughs> okay, where there were leaders who just didn't have any balls, um, we had major trouble. Because there was nothing was clear to me about about the authority, and where there's an authority gap, I step in. That's another part of the profile. But I, I mean, if if there's a hole, I'm going to step in. Um, when my trust level drops, when my trust level drops, I may start to believe that I'm no longer respected. That's. That's kind of internal language. That's the internal conversation I'm going to have to deal with. Uh, I can withdraw mentally or physically. Uh, left to my own devices, I would often live in a cave. Um, <laughs> I was working at uh, the restaurant with uh, Zoe and his brother, Alain. And um, things were not, th it was one of the days in the beginning when th many things were not working as well as they could have. And something was going on, and, and I realized that it was, it, the wheels were coming off. And um, Alec came to me afterwards, and he said, where did you go? I said, well, what do you mean? I, I mean, is there doing my stuff? But he had, he had understood that I had just, I'd, I'd gone to a happy space somewhere else. 
I had completely disengaged. I mean, I, w I was functioning, not functioning well, but I had completely disengaged. And I, uh, I went home and I, I pulled out my profile, I read it, and, and you know what it says? It says, when I get stressed in a group situation in front of other people, my natural tendency, my stress behavior is to disengage. And if, if, it, if I can disengage physically, I'll do that. If I can't, I, I got lots of places I can go in my head. And I, I'm going to go there all the time. It's a nice place. <clears throat> um, when, I, when, when trust drops, uh, any ability that I have to follow a plan goes to zero. Well, that helps me understand some of where things, the wheels have come off for me in the past. Okay. Well, anyway, that's just... There are more pages there. If you want to, if you want a sample brief, uh, you can write me, and and I would be pleased to uh, to send you one, uh, so you can you can see the whole thing. So, how or where might you see this as helpful or useful? Huge potential relationship. Um, actually, there's a couple in the church here. Uh, I, I did their profiles together, spent uh, another two hours debriefing with them, and they are understanding things about the relationship they have never understood before. So, yeah, great. Work relationships, wonderful. Yes? Well, I, I've heard a lot of analysis about where Jesus falls in the different profiles, the DIS profile, the MBTI, and so on, and everybody says Jesus was perfectly centered. Um, I, I'm, I, have, I have some personal questions about that, cause, because I don't think, that would say that only a centered person is, is the full or whole or ideal person. So, um, you know, I, I can see all the colors in Jesus. He was yellow when he organized the disciples to, uh, to uh, yeah, well, we're going to start with the worst color. When he organized all the disciples to distribute food and take up the, all right, so he very detailed, very organized. He was systematic in his teaching. He was red because uh, he, he wasn't happy just telling you some stuff that was nice for your mind, but he wanted action and change behavior. He was green because he was a master communicator, and certainly uh, he was blue because he was like me, spiritual, deep thinker, um, I, I mean, he had times where he went away to his own little cave, didn't he? 40, 40 days in the If I could have 40 days without people. <gasps> oh. Okay. <laughs> what does it cost? What does it cost? Uh, a full Berkman profile is uh, 325. Berkman plus the Berkman on demand would be 425. Berkman and demand only would be a hundred. Uh, I can offer a, a special price for people who are in church or um, uh, not-for-profit uh, organizations because Berkman, the Berkman organization, gives me a different price if uh, if I'm working with a church or not-for-profit people. Uh, Roger Berkman, who created this model, is a practicing believer, and um, his his view of man is wonderful. Uh, so I also have a special price for those of you who are here today. If you're interested in having a Berkman profile done, uh, the, the Berkman on demand, the easy one, the lay, the lay one, uh, we can do that for $75. If you want the full-blown thing, it's $175. If you want both, uh, it would be uh, $250. Uh, if you have one or the other, either the full Berkman or the Berkman only, and you, you want later to have the other one added, that can be done uh, for a price that I have to figure out because it's not on the screen and I can't remember how to do that. But I, 